All right, what's going on here, Aztec fans? John Schaefer with you on the wrap-up show. I'll be with you for the next 45 minutes or so. If you are here, if you wouldn't mind subscribing, I uh, do appreciate that. So, again, if you're here, if you wouldn't mind subscribing, we've got year-on content for Aztec fans. You can smash the like button for me. You can follow me on Twitter at John Schaefer. That is J-O-N-S-C-H-A-E-F-F-E-R. Again, at John Schaefer, J-O-N-S-C-H-A-E-F-F-E-R. Uh, if you're here live right now, if you wouldn't mind letting me know where you're watching from, you can put that in the live chat. If you're here on replay, please comment down below. Let us know where you're watching the wrap-up show from. Uh, we'll get your comments as well. If you want to get your comments in, if you have questions, uh, we can get your comments. do appreciate your support of the channel. You can become a member by clicking join down below. You'll get emojis, badges, and additional content. Also, if you want to support the channel with the Super Chat, you can do that by clicking the dollar sign below the chat box. So we appreciate your support of the channel, obviously um, not the Saturday that Aztec fans were hoping for, taking their perfect 3-0 record to the pit in Albuquerque in the Mountain West. And it was a bit of a tale of two games, wasn't it? The way San Diego State started, led by 12 points with five minutes to play in the first half, didn't commit a turnover in the first 13 or 14 minutes. Then the game really turned on its head. Um, and there's a number of reasons as to why. We can get into a number of them here tonight. I know we'll talk about officiating. I think this game goes well beyond officiating as well for um, the Aztecs on Saturday. But New Mexico took control of the game behind Jalen House. We've seen that before, whether it was last year at Viejas Arena or this past Saturday at the pit when trailing by 12, House took over. He scored 11 consecutive points. He turned the Aztecs over a couple of times. He was feeding off the energy in the building. And he really used that to his advantage. Um, Aztecs were in foul trouble throughout the course of the game. I think they had four players at two fouls at the half. They had three players at three fouls one minute into the second half. Um, and while I do think officiating is a story coming out of the game, I don't think it's the story coming out of the game in the 88-70 loss. Fact uh, of the matter was San Diego State, again, for 15 minutes was the better team. And then the final 25 minutes, New Mexico really did play well in this game. At one point, they won a 50 to 19 run. And I think there's a lot that goes into it, um, whether it was the foul trouble, whether it was the adversity of playing on the road in that type of environment, which San Diego State's obviously familiar with. But, you know, the pit, when it's sold out, is one of the louder, better environments, obviously, in the country. Brian Dutcher has talked about that previously. Um, but just dealing with adversity in that spot, trying to overcome a really good team in New Mexico, overcome some poor officiating in the game. Um, Aztecs were really unable to get to the free throw line as much as they had been recently. Jaden Ledee only getting to the free throw line three times. So, you know, New Mexico frustrated the Aztecs. It was a close game. I think with 15 minutes to play, the first media timeout of the second half came at 14.55, and the Aztecs trailed by three. At one point in the second half, they trailed by one, and then New Mexico just kind of took control of the game over the last 15 minutes. The Aztecs really never threatened once New Mexico opened it up to eight, then 10, then 12, at one point as large as 22 points in an 88 to 70 win. So um, there's a lot of things to dissect coming out of it, I would say. Um, I wouldn't make more of it other than the fact that it is one game, and we'll see if the Aztecs can rebound from it, learn from it when they play Wednesday against Nevada at Viejas Arena. I now see that as a critical game. I don't know if it's in that must-win category, but I see it as a critical game for a number of reasons. NCAA tournament resume, Mountain West regular season standings, seeding in the Mountain West tournament, seeding in an NCAA tournament hypothetically as well. So I think Wednesday now becomes, if it's not a must win, close to a must win, considering next Saturday you're back on the road against a team that's playing good basketball in Boise State. Um, so yeah, a lot to get into. And again, if you're here, if you wouldn't mind subscribing, this is a pretty new channel that we got off the ground about six months ago. So if you wouldn't mind telling other people about it, Aztec fans, college hoop fans, fans of West Coast basketball, please uh, subscribe. Please smash the like button for me. And please, again, follow me on Twitter at John Schaefer. That is J-O-N-S-C-H-A-E-F-F-E-R. You know, in addition to what I think most people discussed in the you know hours that followed this game and during the game, everyone was talking about officiating, officiating, right? Um, how it was one-sided, right? That was the that was the common sentiment among Aztec fans. I think there's a lot more in this game, whether it was the fact that New Mexico was plus ten on the glass in this game, whether it was the Aztec struggles from the free throw line. Were they eleven of twenty in this game or eleven of twenty-one? I think in this game. Um, the blocks from New Mexico, New Mexico was incredible. I think they set a 
program record with 14 blocks in this game. I mean, you look at the final box score and it doesn't scream 20 point game. It just doesn't. New Mexico shot well, but not incredibly well. They shot 44%. They only hit 29% of their threes and they only hit 68% of their free throws, but they did hit 10 more free throws than the Aztecs in an 18 point game. Again, not the end all be all, but a factor. You know, San Diego State, it's not like they shot 32% in this game. They shot 41%. They hit the same number of threes as New Mexico. They were only 11 of 20 from the free throw line. I thought turnovers was a story because, again, for 15 or 16 minutes, the Aztecs didn't turn the basketball over. And then they finished with 13. They were minus three there. They allowed 16 points off turnovers, which is a high number for the Aztecs. Getting out rebounded by 10 is a significant number. They allowed 14 offensive rebounds, which led to 15 second chance points. Again, significant numbers. I thought the bench for the Aztecs was really good at times. Miles Bird, 13 points in 19 minutes, had a couple of big plays. In the first half, Darion Tremel was really good offensively in the first half. We didn't see a ton of Jay Powell in this game. He had four points and four rebounds in 17 minutes. Miles Heidi off the bench had a couple of points for the Aztecs. Really, um, in terms of the starters, the only player that was able to reach double figures was Jaden Ledee, and he wasn't a huge factor. I mean, he always puts his stamp in one way or another on a game, but in 36 minutes, I would say the Lopez did as well on Ledee as maybe any team has done on Ladie this year. 15 points, but on 6 of 15 shooting. Only got to the free throw line three times. He was 3 of 3. Six rebounds, four assists for Ladie. But then your other starters were not in double figures. Lamont Butler, seven points, did have five assists to two turnovers. Micah Parris, six points all coming in the second half with two of seven from the floor. Reese Waters, who's been bothered by that ankle, six points in 26 minutes on two of eight shooting. Elijah Saunders hit a three in 23 minutes. He scored five points for the Aztecs, but it was just too much a house in Mashburn. And by the way, that has not necessarily been who those players have been this year. I think they both have missed either seven or eight games this year, and they had not combined to score 30 points in any game this season. Remember, they scored 51 last year at, at um, Viejas in that 76-73 win over the Aztecs, where Jalen House was feeding off the energy in the building, and I think scored 28 or 29 points in that game. Well, yesterday, he scored 26 points. And then Jamal Mashburn, who was quiet early scored 19 points most of those in the second half and then really the story i would say was the freshman jt toppin and we'll see how the aztecs fare against toppin and this new mexico team and the lopos come to san diego in the middle of february but toppin was 17 points 16 rebounds and he somehow did that while shooting one of 10 from the free throw line so you know i mean again i think you give Credit to New Mexico because they found a way to win the game. Um, it was essentially their Super Bowl. They had to win the game in terms of solidifying an at-large NCAA tournament resume. I mean, they, they have work to do. It's only January. San Diego State has work to do because it's only January. But again, in terms of who was this game more important for, I would have told you before the game it was New Mexico, and I would tell you coming out of the game it was more important for New Mexico, and maybe that's why they played in the manner in which they played from a metrics perspective, you wouldn't think when you're playing quad one and quad two games, you would take on much water. I think the Aztecs still in their final 14 games of the regular season have six quad one games. This was a quad one game, uh, but they still have six quad one, four quad two, and then four combined quad three or quad four games. So about 75% of the remaining regular season games will be in the first two quadrants. And typically when you play those games, win or lose, well, if you win, you can impact your resume, obviously, in the metrics in a positive manner. When you lose, you don't typically take on water. However, coming off out of a game like this, and Dutch talked about this a little bit post-game. If you read some of the post-game quotes, he said that, you know, New Mexico in this metric era of college basketball left their starters in for the entire game. And he understands it because the metrics matter. And this is a way for New Mexico to move up in the rankings and a way to drop San Diego State as well. So I think if you lose this game by four points, you go from something like you know 20th to 21st in the net or Ken Palm. But because they lost by 18 points, they actually slipped about five spots in both Ken Palm and the net. I don't have either of them in front of me right now, but I think San Diego State is roughly 25th in both of the metrics after entering the day around 20th in both of the metrics. So again, at the end of the day, not not the worst drop. Um, it would have been a lot worse, for example, if you lose you know, a quad four road game or a quad three home game, you could drop 10, 12, 14 spots. If you look at the net in any one given day, some of the best wins and worst, lo worst losses this time of year are worth 10 or 15 spots up or down in the rankings. Now that will probably go down as the season prolongs. Like if you lose a quote unquote bad game in February, you're probably not dropping 10 or 15 spots. 
But if you do it in January, again, there's still some fluctuation there. You could drop 10 or 15 spots. You could still move up 10 or 15 spots. Not if you're San Diego State because they're so close to the top of the rankings in the uh, net and Ken Palm. But again, you can gain a couple of spots. But you could fall a lot, again, if you lose something like a home game to Wyoming or a road game to Fresno State. That's where you're really putting your resume in jeopardy. And by and large, under Brian Dutcher for years now, really since the advent of the net, which I think goes back to the 2019-20 season, the pandemic season, when the Aztecs started 26-0, Aztecs find ways to beat teams they should beat. Those quad three, quad four games, they routinely win, um, almost without exception, by the way. Very few exceptions going back to 2019-20. And then they've been good in the first two quadrants as well, including this year. Even with this loss, I think the Aztecs right now are 5-3. and three. In the first two quadrants, they do not have a loss outside of quad one, and all of their quad one losses right now are on the road. But again, now the emphasis turns to Wednesday night, 8 p.m. against Nevada. When you consider New Mexico and Boise State on the road, you'd be staring at a losing streak and potentially, you know, a longer losing streak, especially by San Diego State standards, if you cannot beat Nevada on Wednesday night. And it'll be a challenge. New, um, excuse me, Nevada did lose at home to Boise State on Friday night, so they've got the additional day of rest. It's just their second loss of the season. It was their first home loss, whether it's Jared Lucas or Keenan Blackshear. Uh, they're veteran, they're experienced, they've got a lot back, and they're 15-2. and two. So, you know, San Diego State at home has been dominant in the Mountain West historically. Um, and that's continued, obviously, under Brian Dutcher. But you almost have to be perfect at home this year, considering how hard it's going to be on the road. And if not perfect, something like 8-1 and one in conference games. We know that's going to be challenging with the Nevadas and the Boise States and the Utah States and the New Mexicos and the Colorado States. Like The most challenging Aztec home games of the season in the conference are still to come. They've played Fresno State and UNLV. I think UNLV is a good team. But I think some of those other teams might be great teams here in 2024. So seven remaining home games in the league, all of them crucial. Of course, the road games are crucial, but you don't have to be perfect on the road. You might have to be near perfect at home for San Diego State here in 2024 for them to accomplish their goals. What are those goals? High seed in the Mountain West tournament, higher seed in the NCAA tournament, right? So a lot of work to be done. We're only basically at the midway mark of the season, and we're still just about 20 to 25% into conference play. Four of 18 games have been played for the Aztecs. All right. Um, as you make your way in, if you would not mind uh, subscribing, whether you're here live or on replay, we do appreciate that. If you're here live, thank you for the super chats. You can click the dollar sign below the chat box. I'll get to all of your super chats here tonight. I will tell you about our title sponsor, Eric Lanier at Higher Impact Financial. If you're looking for a financial planner, please do click that link in the description down below. Um, in addition to that, um, I'm going to get to some of the comments here in the chat. So if you're here in the chat, I'll get to some of those comments. Um, and let me do that right now. Some people letting me know where they are watching from here tonight. Kevin in Oceanside, I believe that's Kevin. Uh, Aztec Clyde in Penasquitos. We've got Nima in Costa Rica. Pretty cool. Rich in Carlsbad. Um, some additional comments here in the chat. Uh, House was creating the energy in the building. They love him there. I mean, there's no question about it. I mean, if you were watching this game on television, um, this player, Jalen House, completely relishes big moments and completely relishes whether it's the support of home fans at the pit or even I think he kind of embraces being that you know enemy underdog villain role because we saw it last year and he really fed off that FBA House Arena. I mean, there were a lot, you know, I don't want to get into, you know, litigate every single call in this game because that would, you know, require a lot of due diligence, to be honest. And it obviously was not a well-officiated game. Um, and I don't think it was solely against San Diego State. I think it felt like primarily it was against the Aztecs, maybe because of the way the game transpired. But this was not a well-officiated game. I don't think it was the end-all, be-all. I don't think it's the primary takeaway coming out of this game. Um but I think that you know both things can be true. I think New Mexico played well, and I think the officiating was poor in this game, and I think both things can be true. Um, as we were talking about earlier, Gefilte Fish, I like that name. Uh, rebounding and free throws were an issue for sure. Yeah, there's no question about it. I mean, JT Toppin, um, the free throw struggles. I think the Aztecs missed two front ends of one and ones which also would have given them a couple of more free throws in the game. So, you know, is it different with – you know, hitting 90% of your free throws and getting a better whistle? Yeah, maybe. But, I mean, New Mexico, 
again, was was pretty darn good the final 25 minutes of the game. And for whatever reason, San Diego State just, you know, once New Mexico went on that run, the Aztecs could never recover. They weren't saved by the bell of the half. You know, they got to the half only trailing by three despite a 17-0 run. And then they pulled to within one early in the second half. And it was only, again, a three-point game with about 15 minutes to play. So what was it? Was it foul trouble? Was it elevation? Was it New Mexico? Was it the crowd? Was it the officiating? Because Now, I will say this. I think the officials and then in turn New Mexico to some extent got under the skin of San Diego State. And by the way, we're all human beings. It got under the skin of Aztec fans. So I feel as if it's understandable. But there were multiple technicals. There was a flagrant. So it felt like a lot of rhythm was taken away from this game. And it felt like the Aztecs were hit with some calls that really were kind of adversity type moments that were tough to overcome. And I think that's reasonable and fair. It's not often you're going to see like multiple technicals and a flagrant on one team in a game. Like maybe you get one and there was the double technical and there was the J pal technical, which I didn't think was warranted. But again, that's from my seat um, watching this game on television, on CBS. I'm trying to think what else happened. Miles Bird, was he teed up or he was called for a flagrant in this game? A hook and hold he was called for in this game. So Again, they didn't get every single break in this game. There's no question about that. I think New Mexico got a good whistle. But again, I don't know if it was the difference. I really don't know if it's the difference in this game. Thank you for watching from East County. Um, no doubt, Kevin. I agree with that. It wouldn't have been 14 fouls, obviously, if this game was, you know, properly officiated. You know, that or excuse me, 14 blocks. You know, who knows if the number would have been nine, something like that, 10, but it wouldn't have been 14. I think that's a good point. I do. Um, you know, the foul trouble thing, and I'll pull up a final box here because you had Parrish foul out, you had Butler finish with four, you had Bird finish with four, you had Waters with three. I want to say it was Parrish, Butler, Waters that had three with 19 minutes to play in the second half. So that was a storyline. Again, not the end-all be-all because you still had you know, Parrish actually only played 17 minutes in this game. He sat the final 16 minutes, I think, of the first half after he picked up that second personal. Um, you had four Aztecs with two personals at the break. And, you know, typically the Aztecs do not like to play players with two personals in the first half, but I think they were essentially forced to because so many players had two personal fouls. But, yeah, in addition to the officiating, the fact that Aztecs were in foul trouble, I think did absolutely impact the rotation and the bench and the player usage by Brian Dutcher yesterday at the pit. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. Again, there were a lot of them, folks. There were a lot of them. There were a lot of them. I do think at the end of the day, and, you know, it's easy to say this in a, you know, 18 point game. It's easy to say, hey, one team played with more energy, one team played with more hustle, one team got to more 50 50 balls. But that one team, we say that about because they ended up being the team that had the 15 or 20 point advantage. I don't feel as if San Diego State didn't want it. I don't feel as if San Diego State didn't hustle. I just feel like New Mexico also really wanted it. And I think New Mexico also really hustled. And New Mexico got to a lot of 50 50 balls. Like you got to remember, they're playing in front of their home crowd with all of that energy behind them. And again, they have to get. They came in one and two in the Mountain West. San Diego State came in three and oh. Who was the game more important for? I mean, you hate to boil it down to something so simplistic, but at the end of the day, all those things add up and all of those things matter. And it may have been the difference in a game like this. Now, is it going to play out entirely the same way when these two teams meet at Viejas February 16th? Of course not. There's always a possibility. We have no idea what happens. New Mexico could win big. San Diego State could win big. It could be a close game won by the Lobos or won by the Aztecs. Um, it'll be a critically important game. New Mexico has really played San Diego State well the last two years. There was the win at Viejas. There was the game where Lamont hit the shot at the buzzer from 25 feet out, where San Diego State trailed by a point inside of the final handful of seconds before the Aztecs put a rabbit out of their hat. And then there's yesterday, where the Lobos won 88-70. So there'll be revenge, I think, on San Diego State's mind in a couple of factors, a couple of ways, because of what happened last year at home, their only home loss. I think San Diego State has never been perfect at home in a season, and that was their only home loss in 2022-23. And then what happened yesterday? That doesn't sit well with Brian Dutcher, his coaching staff, or these players. Not That's not how they're wired. I mean, look at the last seven years under Brian Dutcher. Look at the last 25 years under this era of Aztec basketball with Steve Fisher and Brian Dutcher. This doesn't happen often. I think, you know, does it happen once a year under Brian Dutcher over the last five or six years? Not more than that. Aztecs are not losing more than – one game per year on average by 18 plus points under Brian Dutcher. 
it's an aberration. It's a one-off. And I think that'll play itself out over the course of the next couple of months. But it'll be hard on the road in this league. And they're going to have to steal a game somewhere on the road. They've got one with San Jose State. They're going to need additional wins like Fresno State and Air Force. And then with the remaining group, those teams that are projected to be in the top half of the league, can San Diego State get one or more of those games? And also, can they respond Wednesday night against Nevada? That's a critically important game with Boise State looming on CBS again coming up next Saturday. Um, Let's see here. So answer three, two, one said he made the trip, which is pretty cool. And kept saying, that's a foul. That's a travel. How is that? Not a foul, but the Aztecs needed to make uh, more open shots. Yeah. They had some opportunities to shoot better than they did from the floor. Um, They left some points out there and then New Mexico again, credit their offensive efficiency. They made some plays specifically in the second half. They didn't shoot it well in the first half. I think they shot 35% in the first half. Aztecs outshot New Mexico in the first half, 45 to 35% yet trailed 40 to 37 um gefilte fish says yes can we talk about that weird technical foul what was that all about which one are we talking about are we talking about the hook and hold there were two hook and holds in this game one against new mexico one against san diego state that's kind of a letter of the law um technical where when you kind of grasp and hold when arms get locked like elbow to elbow that is the definition of a hook and hold it seemed like it wasn't as black and white with miles bird because he literally just had his hands up in the air and put his arms down without even seeing the new mexico player and they got tangled and he got called for a hook and hold and this was after he should have been uh or new mexico should have been whistled for a foul against bird um then there was again the parish house kind of stare down there was the pal screen in the middle of the floor. I have no idea how that was called as a, a technical foul. We saw so much physical play yesterday, and you see so much physical play. That, to me, didn't warrant a technical foul. But again, it's subjective, and this is going to happen over the course of a season. Um, there's no question about that. Uh, Larry Joe is watching the Inland Empire. The Lobos are a better team when they play at home. My opinion, New Mexico is the toughest place to win on the road for our Aztecs in the Mountain West. It could be. Uh, the Aztecs had won the last two trips there. Again, last year, Butler, heroics, straight on. Aztecs clinch a share of the regular season title. And then they hadn't played there since 2020. Um, between the 2020 game and Butler hitting that shot at the buzzer last year. And they blew the doors off New Mexico in 2020. 17-0, I think, was the lead at one point, And they won 85-57. Malachi Flynn, KJ Fagan, Yanni Wetzel, Matt Mitchell, Jordan Shackle, right? That team. They looked like the Globetrotters that day. Uh, back in maybe January or February of 2020. So they'd won a couple of games there. But yeah, historically, the pit's tough. Uh, Just like historically, Viejas is tough. Just like historically, Logan is tough. Um, And when they have a good team like they have right now, and they do, New Mexico is talented, and they have not been fully healthy, and they're getting healthier. Whether it's uh, House, Mashburn, Dent, Toppin, Nelly Jr., Joseph, their bench played well, right? They got some productivity off their bench, hit a couple of threes early, um, from one of those players off the bench, they're talented and they've improved from last year. Remember, they were the nation's last undefeated team last year and they didn't make the NCAA tournament. And they're way improved from their first year under Richard Patino, where San Diego State blew the doors off them at VA House Arena. They had no answers inside for San Diego State. So they keep improving. Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing, by the way. I think it's good overall for the Mountain West. And hopefully, the Aztecs will find a way to beat them when these two teams meet at VA House Arena in about a month. Um, Rich says, uh, they were supposed to lose this game, but after going up 12, I thought we might win. I mean, here's the, the what, what is a bit surprising out of this. I think there's a couple things that are surprising. Yeah. Anytime you see San Diego state lose a game by 18 points, that's surprising. And you couple it with the fact that they led by 12 and they didn't lead 12, nothing like two minutes into the game. They led 35, 23 with five minutes to play in the first half. So 15 minutes in, they had a 12 point lead. I think at that point you're thinking, that San Diego State's, well, A, in position to win the game, and B, even if they don't, you would think they were going to lose a close game because they've got a 12-point lead. But again, from that moment until the end of the game, the Aztecs were outscored by 30. So that's a huge swing over 25 minutes. Why did it happen? That's why we're here tonight. That's what we're discussing. And again, I think that there's a lot that comes out of Saturday that's probably teachable and areas of improvement, including rebounding, some of the turnovers in the second half. Um And we'll see how they rectify some of that coming out of this game into Wednesday night against Nevada. I don't think it's a game where you want to overreact to anything. 
like any game. I think you got to be careful not to overreact to a big win, and you got to be careful not to overreact to a big loss. Um, how do you turn the page and prepare and get yourself in a position where you can feed off the energy at Viejas Arena on Wednesday night and win a game against a good team? Because Nevada is a good team, and they've got Jared Lucas, who's burnt the Aztecs before. They have Keenan Blackshear, as a very good physical threat and a good scorer um, and a good veteran player. And they've got many other players. K.J. Himes is on this team. Um, who else? Nick Davidson's a veteran. Trey Coleman is a veteran. So like a lot of teams in the Mountain West, they're older. Um, they've got some experience, and they played very well in the non-conference. And that's really a theme with teams in the Mountain West here in 2024. Um, okay, I'm going to get back to the chat in a moment. Um, and again, if you're here, if you wouldn't mind subscribing, year-round content for Aztec fans. Really do appreciate that. Please smash the like button for me, and please follow me on Twitter at John Schaefer. That is J-O-N-S-C-H-A-E-F-F-E-R. Um, I do want to remind you about our title sponsor here on the wrap-up show. I just talked to Eric actually over the course of the weekend. He's about to do a financial plan for me and my family, and we are thrilled for that. We're going to do it at some point. In the next week or two, if you are looking for a financial planner, Eric Lanier is here for you. You can click the link in the description down below. He solves a couple of problems for people to meet with him. The first is that he's found that too many people do not have a financial plan, okay? And then the second is that most of us just don't have clear, defined financial goals. So Eric specifically works with business owners and entrepreneurs and working families and here's the thing. If you click the link in the description down below, you can set up a free 15-minute call with Eric. And his firm is different than anything you've experienced before from a financial advisor. And he's going to ask you the questions. That'll separate him from others. And again, if you're looking for someone to help you, um, he is there for you. Any financial needs, um, he truly runs his firm like a family office, personalized specifically for the, for the needs you have. Eric's commitment to you is that no matter what, You'll leave better off than you were before and let them know that we sent you to him as well, the wrap-up show. So click that link in the description down below. Can't wait to meet with Eric at some point here in January um, to come up with a financial plan for me and my family. And I hope you do the same by clicking the link again in the description down below. All right, got another 15 or 20 minutes here. I see a lot of people are in the chat. I'll try to run through a few of these. Um, Aztec Clyde wants to know what I think of the non-conference schedule for Nevada. Let me take a look at it while I grab a drink of water here. You don't realize how, um, how much sometimes you need a sip of water when you're doing a show solo, but, uh, thanks for bearing with me. Yeah. I'm looking at their non-conference schedule. I mean, they won at Washington, which I think is a solid win. They were blown out in Henderson by Drake. Um, yeah, I mean, there wasn't a ton on their non-conference schedule. I think the TCU win in Hawaii is an excellent win. That's a great win. So, you know, I think their best win is TCU neutral. I think that of their two losses, clearly 72-53 to Drake is a bit of an outlier. Slipping up at home to Boise State could be costly. That's what happened Friday night. But they're still in good position. Now, they've got work to do, I would say, in conference. And if they lose Wednesday, that'll be back-to-back -back losses for Nevada in the league. And then they'll have a huge game against Wyoming on Saturday in Laramie that they're basically going to have to win. Um, but there's opportunities for them like there's opportunities for everyone in the league because they're you know facing five or six teams with really good resumes. So they don't have to be perfect just like San Diego State doesn't have to be perfect. Let's see here. I'm just trying to catch up in the chat right now. Um, Kevin, I don't see it like this. Um, I really don't. What I haven't seen mentioned was coaching. Dutcher's seldom out coached. I think he was here. If you wouldn't mind going further, I mean, how do we, how does that apply to yesterday's game? What part of the game plan or the in-game coaching did San Diego State not fare well in? The fact that they had a lead and then – you know, they had a large lead and then they had there was a large deficit. I mean, what was it specifically you wish they would have done better? Rebound the basketball? Well, that's, I mean, obvious. I mean, that's that's easy. Or not turn the basketball over? Sure. Or not get in foul trouble or hit more free throws? Or, yeah, I don't know, get more stops? You know, I, I didn't see anything that screamed coaching. I saw what, what, what it screamed to me was New Mexico took advantage of like the snowball effect, which was playing at home getting calls, hitting shots, getting stops. 
So to me, it was a bit of a snowball effect. That Dutch took a timeout up eight, 35-27 after the house steal of Trammell at midcourt, um, which was a very quick timeout by SDSU Brian Dutcher standards. So he tried to stop that run right there, and they then proceeded to score 13 more points in a row, and it was a 17-0 run. But I think it was a bit of a shell shock moment, those final five minutes of the first half. I thought the Aztecs maybe were saved by the bell, getting to the locker room, trailing by just three. But again, it was more of the same a little bit from, I'd say, the 15-minute mark until the end of the game in the second half. Okay, um, let's see here. Yeah, th this, um, you know, I, I watched an interview with, Richard Patino on Field of 68 with my buddy John Fanta last night. I actually watched it back today. And I want to say that Richard Patino apologized for Brian Dutcher for some of the antics of Jalen House, specifically when he was like, I don't even know if he like jawed right at Dutch or the coaching staff, but I think Dutch completely, you know, because of, to a credit to who he is as a coach, like he didn't take exception to it and he was, you know, understood that Jalen House is a really good player that was having a really good game. But he said, uh, Eden saying House taught on the Aztecs bench, head coach by storming over to their section and flex flexing after he made that shot with some of the worst sportsmanship I've ever seen. He was on the other side of the court. That's who Jalen House is, right? I mean, it's just who he is. He He's one of these guys that plays with this absurd, you know, chip on his shoulder, high energy, feeds off the home crowd. And I think he's, he's going to really um, embrace being a villain on the road. Um, and sometimes they get him in foul trouble. He was in foul trouble against Colorado State at Moby a couple of weeks ago. And maybe that's going to be the case when he comes to Viejas Arena. He clearly played very physically, and he was getting away with it yesterday. And I think that played a role in some of his mannerisms as well. But once he went on that run, I mean, when he went on that 11-0 run, it completely changed the game. And the fact that it was Jalen House that went on the run as opposed to like Jamal Mashburn or Donovan Den or JT Top, and the fact that it was House – really gets them going it gets house going and it got that crowd going in new mexico as well okay mm, let's see I'm just trying to catch up here in the chat kevin's saying if metrics are uh, leaning as a six bid mountain west and all the top 25 losses this past week it's not as terrible as it seems no it's not terrible i mean if the the only thing that's even bad about it is the margin that's the only thing that's bad if, if the Aztecs lost this game by two well you say man they had opportunities man they could have stolen this game at the pit maybe that's you know worse because it feels like it was in your grasp if you lose by one or two or three points but if they would have lost this game by six points it's not bad at all it would have been deemed a quote-unquote good loss now losing by 18 is never good but it's not a bad loss the margin isn't ideal that's the part that you come away saying you know, I wish the margin wasn't what it was, but credit New Mexico. Again, they kept their starters in for basically 39 minutes, and the Aztecs didn't make a second half run. I mean, typically San Diego State will make a run. Did it against Grand Canyon. Um, they were in the game for 36 minutes, I would say, against BYU. Typically, San Diego State's going to make a run. Last year at New Mexico, I think they were down 12 or 14 in the second half before they made a run. So, um, you know, typically – the Aztecs will make a run. And for whatever reason, yesterday was just not the day for San Diego State. It just wasn't. Um, people talking about the Darion Trammell shot when he was like bumped off balance, like over the side of the backboard. That was a terrific shot. Actually, I, I do want to mention Darion Trammell. There was a great note from San Diego State Sports Information. Trammell surpassing 1,500 career points yesterday with 12 points in that loss. Um, and from an individual perspective, it's really amazing what he's accomplished. He's one of two active players in the nation standing 5'11 or shorter with 1,500 career points. The other is Jalen Cohn at Cal, who we saw in San Juan Capistrano. There are two players that are active in the nation that stand 5'11 or shorter that have 1,500 career points, and one of them is Darion Trammell. And San Diego State did some really good work tonight on social media, whether it was on Instagram or Twitter showing some of the messages from Tramel's family and uh, those that have been inspirational for him coming up and some of his current teammates and former teammates as well, congratulating him on the milestone, which I thought was really well done and I appreciate it. And he's meant a lot to this program in his two years on the Mesa. And he's an amazing story from the City College of San Francisco to Seattle University, no D1 offers out of high school to 
being the most outstanding player at the South Regional last year and being as impactful as he's been for the Aztecs over the last two seasons. So congratulations to Darion Trammell. Well-deserved. Um, he's taken the most or he's made the most of his opportunities in college basketball, and hopefully that continues throughout 2024. Okay, let's see if there's anything else here we can get to. Um, yes, there was. that's exactly right. There was the front-end miss from Waters, who's missed two free throws all year. He hasn't shot a lot since the ankle. Last, last couple of weeks, Waters has not been getting to the free throw line. Um, any any one-on-one -on -one miss can feels impactful when you don't win the game. I go back to last year in the national championship game. I want to say Aztecs trailing by six or seven after they pulled to within five. And then, who was it? Hawkins hit that straight on three. It was eight. And then the Aztecs had it down to like six or seven and then missed the front end of a one and one It may have been Keyshawn Johnson. But front end misses of one and ones in losses feel really important. Um, now, this was in the first half. Obviously, it was not the end-all, be-all. He could have hit two free throws there. And does that really change the outcome? No, but to your point, um, in that run, it played a role because it wouldn't have been a 17-0 run, obviously, if they hit a free throw in that spot. But again, Reese Waters has been incredible from the free throw line. He's been a great, great Aztec in his first year on the Mesa, and I think he's dealing right now with not being 100%. Uh, you know, that's just my sheer speculation. But again, the ankle, um, he's been able to, to stay out there, but he hasn't been scoring at the same clip, and I think it's because he has not been at 100%. Yeah, I read this answer 3-2-1 tonight. Ziegler making an interesting point in his article that the refs had virtually no experience calling Aztec games nor a game at the pit, and all three of them have a 300-plus referee Ken Palm ranking. When you are playing on a Saturday, like let's go through the logistics here. How many Division I games are being played on a Saturday, right? Like 100-plus games. So times that by three, that's how many officials are working. It's well more than 100 games, but you get my point, right? You, you got three, four, five, six hundred officials working and because of that, there are going to be a lot of scenarios where you're not getting the, the best crew because there's 600 officials working. So you're not going to get three top 100 officials if you have 600 officials working. And the Mountain West is not going to get the best officials in college basketball, whether it's because of the location or because of the fact that it's outside the quote unquote power or because they don't get paid as much per game officiating Mountain West games as they get paid officiating Pac-12 games or Big East games, where you get my point. Um, Again, over the course of 30-something regular season games, you're not always going to have Final Four officiating crews. And Mark made some really astute points. The fact, you know, basically the metrics would support the Aztecs had better crews working their games a year ago than they do here in 2023-24. But again, I think no matter who the officiating crew was yesterday, you have to ask yourself, is that going to be the difference between winning and losing the game? It might have put you in a spot where you'd be better positioned to win the game. And again, if they lost this game by two points, it's a completely different story. If they lost this game by four, five, even six points, it's a different story. They trailed by 22 in the second half and lost by 18. And I think it is hard to put all of the blame on officiating yesterday, even though, and I'll, I'll be the first to say it, I thought the officiating was poor, but I'm not going to go all in and say that it is the sole reason why San Diego State lost the game. I thought the officiating was poor. It could have been a difference in the margin, but I don't think it was the reason why or the sole reason why the Aztecs didn't win. Monster Jam was awesome. I was there this afternoon with my son. My four-year-old absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved it. Um, me personally, I don't know much about Monster Jam, but he thought it was like the coolest thing he has ever seen in his life. He thought it was amazing. So thank you for asking. Um, okay, so is this about um, – I forget who said earlier that about questioning like Dutcher and Patino, you know, did he get out coached? I think it was actually Kevin. But Eden Art Garden saying uh, Waters missed seemingly everything. He was two of eight. Uh, questionable decision to play him when he's still obviously not at 100%. No, I mean, you got to play him. If, if he wants to play and he's not 100%, but he's at 60%, 80%, um, I think Reese Waters at 60% or 80% can still win you games. And he clearly wants to play. That's why he's out there. Um, and he says, also question why Dutcher didn't kick Ladie out to the perimeter for threes, because that that's not really where they probably want him. I mean, he shot 40% from beyond the arc this year, but you're picking your spots. He's not going to attempt six, eight threes in a game. He's got a much better chance of scoring 20 points by working on the interior or that 15-foot pull-up game, that free-throw line jumper game, or just extended off the free-throw line. But I, I don't think you want – 
Jaden Ledee with his physicality and size living out on the three-point line. Now, again, if he makes a couple, then you could take a third or a fourth shot, but I don't think you want him attempting seven, eight, nine shots because that really takes away his strengths, and his strengths are getting to the free throw line and scoring you know, close to the rim or from 15 feet, 16 feet, 17 feet, and in is what I would say. This will be a huge game, by the way. Utah State and New Mexico on Tuesday. I'm looking forward to this. I think there's three or four Mountain West games on Tuesday. This league's incredible. In fact, back to what I um, was watching earlier today, Field of 68 podcast with John Fanta, Rob Doster, maybe Jeff Goodman. Um, there was an interesting point made by Richard Pitino, and he didn't say that the Mountain West is at this level yet, but he made the argument that, like, with the right investment and the way the league has played the last couple of years, that the Mountain West could be like the West Coast equivalent of the Big East, especially with the Pac-12 dissolving. Of course, the Big East has won three of the last seven national championships. But then again, you know, Mountain West had a team play for a national championship last year. Look no further than San Diego State. But you've had Villanova win two. You've had UConn win one. But he made the argument like that maybe outside of San Diego State and now maybe outside of UConn, you look at the top six, seven, eight jobs in the Big East, and he said, like, people argue, you know, what are the best six, seven, eight jobs? Maybe outside, like, the top one. And then same thing with the Mountain West. Like, maybe outside of San Diego State, people would argue, like, what are the next best six or seven jobs? Um, but I thought it was an interesting comp. Again, obviously, the Mountain West is not at the level of the Big East, but it's an improving league that's had four teams in the NCAA tournament each of the last two years. I'd be surprised if any less than four teams were in the tournament this year, and I wouldn't be surprised if there were five teams in the tournament. I think six is still a stretch. You'd almost need the perfect balance of results over the next eight weeks for that to transpire, in my opinion. But I think four teams will get into the NCAA tournament. And I would not be surprised if five teams got into the NCAA tournament in 2024. Um, okay, just about maybe taking Ladi out of the game, Kevin. And I understand what you're saying. I mean, I, I would just say this. Ladie is not going to go for 25 and 12 every night, even though like he averages whatever he averages, 21 and 9. It's not going to happen. And there's going to be teams that, I mean, obviously the entire game plan is centered around stopping Jaden Ladie. And Richard Pitino said that post game. He said, we're going to try to have someone else beat us other than Ladie. That was the plan. And credit their big men. Uh, you know, credit Toppin. And again, I think, um, Ladie maybe got frustrated, wasn't getting the calls that he maybe got previously, specifically against San Jose State when he drew 15 fouls uh, just this past week. So, yeah, I, I would credit Richard Pitino for the game plan, but I don't think that just because they slowed down Jaden Ladie means that Brian Dutcher was out coach because, uh, you know, across 30 something games, Jaden Ladie is not going to go for 25 and 10 all 30 something games. So, when he doesn't, what are you able to do to counteract that? You know, who picks up the scoring? Who's able to drop 18 when Ladie scores 13? Um, is it going to be Lamont? Is it going to be Darion? Is it going to be Reese? Is it going to be Micah? Um, how do you combat it when Jaden Ladie isn't scoring 30 points like he did against San Jose State? I'm going to try to get to a few more comments here before I go. I've got a Padres wrap-up show to do in about five minutes. Let's see here. Yeah, Rich saying, you know, those refs took Ladie out of the game. He was fouled hard every time. Yeah, possibly. Possibly. I will say one of the stories coming out of that Nevada-Boise game was I want to say Boise was like plus 19 on the glass. It was something ridiculous. Um, and they won with defense and physicality. They held Nevada to 56 points, well below their season average. Now we know they've got shot makers, and they can make tough shots. Jared Lucas specifically. Uh, Aztecs have been really good against Nevada historically at Viejas Arena, basically like everyone they play in the Mountain West Conference. But again, I don't know if it's a must win, but it's pretty close to a must win because if you don't win it, you're staring at a three-game losing streak because you'd have lost two straight and you're going to Boise on Saturday. So it's a critically important game for the Aztecs on Wednesday. Get there early, be loud. It's an 8 o'clock start. Um, make Viejas like the pit was this past weekend, which is what Viejas is. Aztec fans are incredible. San Diego State is one of the great home court advantages in the nation, and hopefully that continues for the last seven home games of the year because it's a very, very important game. All of these games are. Every single game, home or road, these last 14 regular season games are critically important for the Aztecs um, for just a variety of reasons. So we'll see. Um, again, Wednesday's important. If the Aztecs find a way to win on Wednesday, they are right where they need to be. They'd be 4-1 and one in the Mountain West, heading to Boise, 
And that Boise-San Diego State game, if the Aztecs hold serve on Wednesday night, will be a bit of a coin flip game, is my guess. From a metric and Vegas perspective, you'd be looking at you know San Diego State as you know something like a one or a two point favorite or a one or a two point underdog. So win on Wednesday and San Diego State is in a good spot, but that's under the assumption again that the Aztecs win on Wednesday. So it's a very important game for the Aztecs coming up on Wednesday. We'll have another wrap up show for you in the middle of the week uh, after that Nevada game, and then more for you coming up next weekend as well. Again, if you're looking for year-round content around San Diego State football and basketball, please subscribe to this channel. Really do appreciate that. I got this off the ground about six months ago. If you're looking for even more content, please subscribe to this channel. The more people that interact with the channel that are here live and on replay, the more shows I'm going to do. So please subscribe if you're here. Please smash the like button for me. Please follow me on Twitter at John Schaefer at Jim Russell SD. If you're here on replay, I do appreciate those super thanks. Really do appreciate your support of the channel. And again, whether you're here live or on replay, if you want to become a member, get emojis, badges, content, and more, you can click the link in the description down below. You click that join button, in fact, down below. Um, again, if you are looking for a financial planner, want to support the channel, uh, get in contact with Eric Lanier at Higher Impact Financial. If you want the audio-only edition of the wrap-up show, Click the link in the description down below. Maybe you're on the go, in your car, going for a run or a jog or on the move, whatever it is. You don't want to be on YouTube. You just want the audio of the show. Click the link in the description down below. You get the podcast-only edition of the wrap-up show. I appreciate you guys. Really do. Thank you for hanging out. I appreciate you guys hanging out live. appreciate you guys that are here on replay um, the following day. So thank you guys for hanging out. Again, the Aztecs fall to New Mexico on Saturday, 8870 at the pit. Look at Nevada on Wednesday night at 8 p.m. And we'll have much more for you here on the wrap-up show presented by Eric Lanier at Higher Impact Financial. My name is John Schaefer, and you've been watching the wrap-up show.